appreciate you coming on, man. Yeah, happy to be here. Yeah, so so I guess we met over ten years ago. We first met, I think, just at, about. At, at Duff's. You, yeah. you just I don't know if you were finishing the the um, the documentary or if you were working on that. Yeah, it, I think it it it, it was between. Uh, us finishing it and it being released maybe at that point yeah um, so i remember so anyways we, we met we hung out at, at the party and i remember calling chris afterwards we exchanged numbers and everything and i said i really like this andrew guys i think mm -hmm. i think he's on to something i think he's gonna make something of himself and uh you know here we are 10 plus years later i must have done something yeah if I, if I got invited to your house so <laughs> Uh, get us up to speed. What have you done in those 10 years since we first met? I know that could probably take a long time, but if you don't mind giving high level overview of kind of who you are, what you've done, and then we'll dig into more of how you got there and some of the other things wherever this conversation takes us. Right. Yeah. So, uh, I'm a filmmaker who up to this point has mostly produced documentary films. Uh, when we met, I had at that point had already made a film for ESPN called The Zen of Bobby V, which I produced for ESPN Films while I was still an undergrad at NYU. And that was a film that was eight months in Japan with Bobby Valentine, who at the time was revered as this baseball god in Japan. And um, amazingly, the film premiered at Tribeca and then aired on ESPN the night before I graduated NYU oh. Film School. So, um, you know, after that, there, I was kind of at this crossroads in my career. It just all of a sudden been like jump started big time. You know, I'm, I'm leaving school already with a professional credit. What do I do? I had signed with an agent at the time who was really pushing me and my two buddies who I made that film with to get into reality television. This was also in 2008. Hollywood had just come out of this writer's strike, which was the result, which resulted in the proliferation of a lot of unscripted uh, reality type shows. So that was kind of very much in uh, at the time in Hollywood. I, having gone to film school, wanted to make films. I wanted to make movies. So I always saw documentaries as, um, as more of a pathway to producing narrative feature films than reality television. And so instead of getting into reality TV, I stayed in docs and uh, Bobby Valentine was somebody I called on. You know, we stayed in touch. We had a great experience making that film for ESPN. That when he came back from Japan in 2010, I pitched him this idea of what if we started a production company, raised some money through friends of yours, people who enjoyed the doc that I made about you, and we'll just start with more sports films. And your, your name will be on every one as an executive producer, as kind of a good housekeeping seal that, hey, this is pretty authentic, uh, mm. especially if Bobby Valentine's name is on it. And the first film that we did produce uh, was about baseball in the Dominican Republic. It was called uh, Pelotero. Uh, it was released in the US as ball player Pelotero, Pelotero being the Spanish word for ball player. Um, and that followed two, basically hoop dreams of baseball. It followed two uh, Dominican teenagers on their quest to get signed with their Major League Baseball team. And that was uh, a, a project I learned about through a friend of mine I grew up with. He went to college with these guys who embedded themselves in the DR for about a year and a half, trying to find like the next big thing out of the DR. Um, and the, yeah, they came across these really interesting stories and they had incredible footage. So they, I met them just as Bobby and I were starting our company together and raising money, um, in the fall of 2010. And they sent us a DVD of, of like an eight minute, what's called like a sizzle reel. And I played it for Bobby and he said, you know, I've been going to the Dominican Republic for baseball for, you know, over 30 years. And he said, I've never seen anybody capture it the way these guys have. I mean, he's like, this is exactly what it's like. So that's the film that you're talking about that yeah. I think we'd, um, we had just finished producing. John Lekozamo narrated it. And uh, if the summer of 2011, we were trying to figure out where is it going to end up. We were applying to film festivals. And for people who don't know, applying to a film festival to get into a film festival is basically like applying to college. Um, you know, it's an open, open submission process, but really it's a lot of politicking behind the scenes, who you know, who's in the movie. Uh, so it's stressful. Nothing's a sure thing. Uh, and I think we were probably going through that at that point. What ended up happening is the film, uh, premiered at the Hamptons Film Festival, which is a really good film festival out in the Hamptons every October. And we got distribution 
Bobby soon after got hired by the Boston Red Sox to be their manager for the 20, uh, the 2012 season. And the film came out the all-star break while he, uh, of the 2012 season, while he was managing the Boston Red Sox. So needless to say, a gritty, authentic look at the, the baseball development system in the DR, executive produced by a then current Major League Baseball manager, did not sit well with the powers that be at Major League Baseball, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, certainly Bobby had to endure a lot of grief and a lot of stress. Uh, it was great for the film, uh, the coverage that, you know, the New York Post and a lot of other outlets, the Associated Press, because Bud Selig actually addressed the film at his annual press conference at the, at the All-Star Game. Um, Bud Selig, the commissioner of baseball at the time, uh, basically saying the film was outdated and inaccurate. And somebody asked the smart follow-up question of, well, have you seen it? And he said, no, no, I haven't seen it. Um, and the, and what was really unfortunate about the whole controversy was because of Bobby's relationship with major league baseball, um, you know, having been a coach and a player and a manager, you know, he, he really wasn't looking to burn any bridges or cause any problems. Uh, so we had actually given major league baseball numerous opportunities while we were editing the film. We had reached out to them countless times. I can, I can think of three off the top of my head throughout the process of saying, Hey, we, we, you know, we're working on this. Here's a cut, you know, just, just kind of letting you guys know. And I think, um, it probably maybe got lost in the show. I don't know what happened, but they felt like they were caught flat footed, uh, when the whole thing came out. And, uh, the, the upside though, is that I've, I've heard from friends in baseball that say that a lot of scouting departments change the way they do things down there as a result of it. Um, I mean, it's been used because the story without getting into yeah, too much of the weeds, know, yeah. the one, it follows these two kids. One of the kids is named Miguel Sano, who is now a, uh, you know, a power hitter for the Minnesota twins. But at the time he was one of the most highly sought after prospects in the Dominican Republic. And the story kind of gets into how the scout from the Pittsburgh pirates started planting these seeds of doubt of, is the kid lying about his age? Is he lying about his identity? And it totally killed his market value, this Miguel Sano's market value um, free agency down there. And he was basically just left with the, the Pittsburgh Pirates as the only potential bidder. Um, and Major League Baseball didn't seem to be all that interested in helping the Sano family get to the bottom of, you know, the investigation over his age and identity. It was kind of a mess. Um, and that's all in the film. You know, there's even hidden camera footage of the scout from the Pirates talking to Miguel's family and saying, you know, if you sign with me, all this investigation will go away. And so, yeah. Um, but like I said, the positive from that experience, um, you know, Bobby had to endure some, some uh, you know, some grief at the, at, you know, from different levels of baseball. But in the long term, like I said, some some good has come out of it. Scouting departments maybe change the way they they deal with prospects in the DR, and um, yeah, and ultimately that's the finances aside. When you're dealing with documentaries, especially ones that that have a specific issue attached to them, if you can see some sort of change out of it, that's always um, a tremendous satisfaction. And I'm very lucky that we've managed to do so. Since then, Bobby and I we've produced about six feature docs together, a handful of short documentaries. Uh, and now we're starting to move out of out of sports and and out of documentaries now with a with a new scripted movie project uh, that we're working on. So interesting. So yeah. how did you connect with Bobby? So that was uh, it was really just finding a friend of a friend of a friend. It was actually my one of my classmates at NYU. His best friend from high school's mom knew Bobby's sister in law. I love that. So statistically friends of friends, I don't know the statistics of friends of friends of friends, yeah. but friends of friends are your best contacts. Right. Getting a job, raising money, just statistically across the board, those friends of friends and fringe friends are your best contacts because you're not in the same echo chamber. You know, you're, you, they're, they're in different paths, different access. So I'm, without I'm, a doubt, I mean, I can, I can attest to that because, you know, I grew up, um, my mom is a teacher, my dad's a lawyer had no contacts in the entertainment industry. I go to NYU for film school. Uh, there's no, there's no uncle I can call on <laughs> for a summer job or anything like that. 
So it was all about just hustling. And I hooked up with two, with two classmates who had a similar drive and, uh, we were looking to do projects together. And we had read this article that Bobby Valentine was this huge, larger than life celebrity in Japan. Like they built street, they built statues to him. They named streets after him. It was something that ultimately we captured in the film, but you really had to see it to believe it. Um, and because Bobby was known as this kind of outlandish figure in the States, he, he still is probably most famous for getting kicked out of a game and sneaking back into the dugout wearing a fake mustache and sunglasses. <laughs> so the fact that he was this yeah. this this huge celebrity in Japan, uh, and, and the reason for it was that he had basically, he was managing the worst, arguably the worst team in Japanese baseball history, the Chiba Lote Marines, uh, that played in Chiba, which is the New Jersey or the Connecticut to Tokyo's New York. Uh, and his second season there, they win the championship. And he was the first American, uh, manager to lead a team to the Japan series. Um, and not only that, but he was learning Japanese. He would only eat Japanese food. So he was this, uh, big ambassador of Japanese baseball. And we read this, this article about Bobby. Be, I think at the time, what the article was about was he had challenged the Chicago White Sox, who had won the World Series at the same time, to a true World Series. You know, it was basically my team versus yours. We'll play it in Hawaii. We'll give the money to charity. And Ozzie Guillen, who was the manager of the White Sox at the time, laughed at Bob and said he's an idiot. Like we'd kick their ass. I remember that. So, remember so that. we had thought, how cool would it be to make a documentary with Bobby Valentine in Japan? And we've reached out to him through again my friend's mom's who knew Bobby's sister-in-law. We got his email. We sent him this whole pitch. We're sophomores at NYU, have no real capability to make a documentary, uh, but we say, you know, we want to follow you around for the year. And he just writes back one line, go get him. Wow. So that was that kind of, uh, was all the, the consent we needed to, yeah, try and make something happen. Yeah, which, amazing. And here yeah. we are, you know. Here we are, yeah. Wow. What has been some of the best experiences that you've had? I know you've had so many. It's a loaded question. Um, are there any experiences in particular that are clear walk away takeaways from your interaction with, with Bobby? Um, you know, Bobby has been very, is, is a very generous person. I think getting back to the, just the general theme of networking and, and building a network of people that, um, it is truly based on the relationship, not necessarily the transaction of what can this person do. I mean, Bobby, um, I, you know, there's an expression I've heard other people say that know Bobby, but the only people who don't like Bobby are the people who don't know him. And, you know, cause you'll, again, he has this, he had this persona certainly when he was managing the Mets and, and, and then he, he didn't do himself any favors when he was at the Red Sox. But he, you know, wore his heart on his sleeve. He's very outspoken. So he had this perceive this perception of, oh, Bobby Valentine's this arrogant a-hole. And, you know, he certainly has an ego without a doubt. And it's a healthy ego. But he does, he's, he knows what he's talking about in baseball. Like it's, it's deserved. I, I, I certainly feel so. But, uh, th to that point, people who don't know him think, oh, Bobby Valentine, what a jerk. But once you get to know him, you realize how, um, you know, he, he genuinely, he, he's a hero in Stanford, Connecticut and all around Fairfield County where he grew up. And he's very proud of where he came from. He's all about giving back. Um, but just like little stories of people, just, just Bobby, um, you know, giving people time or, uh, you know, just, just helping them out. And that's the, just his generosity again, just in terms of his, his, his time and his willingness to, to help people out when there may be even no perceived upside for him it, it is I, I think he certainly lives um lives by a mantra of you kind of you get what you give and mm -hmm. he's he's a big he's definitely a big giver and and i think that's why he's been very successful in kind of every avenue that he's he's perceived so per pursued so he's been a tremendous role model and mentor for me without a doubt yeah so i i met him once at a hot stove dinner um, that's like essentially like a, a, a kick, a, a fundraiser. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with yeah. those, maybe who aren't. It's a, essentially like a fundraiser or a kickoff for the year that's going to come. Is that the best way you feel like to sure. be fair? So he was there. He was supposed to just speak for half an hour and leave. Uh, I, I feel like it was not good weather. It was up in Massachusetts too, or maybe the Connecticut and Massachusetts area, not close. 
to where he lives. Uh, not only was he there early, not only did he speak for over half an hour, not only was it just funny, fun, entertaining, he was self-deprecating, mm. he ended up sticking around, signed a bunch of, I mean, he just really went above and beyond. And I, I, got, I had, even though I am a Mets fan, even though I was familiar with his career, I was, I did have a different impression of him going in than how I left. So your point about those who, you know, don't like him, don't know him, mm -hmm. or however that quote was great, whatever it was. Yeah. But no, well, and but it's true. Is is and that's you spend enough time with Bobby, you see that time and time again. Where, um, I, look, I wouldn't be in the situation I'm in if he didn't write. Like I said, go get him. Mm -hmm. He he's he's somebody that is willing to. Um, and there's a long story too when we actually did meet him and pitch him the idea of following him around for the year, he said that was the worst idea he'd ever heard in his life. <laughs> but but fortunately, again, he didn't get up and walk away. I mean, there's always a willingness to try and make something happen. Mm -hmm. And um, no, I'm, I'm very lucky that, that he, like I said, that he's he's was not only in my life to like get my career started, but has been been there by my side as, as we've worked together on other projects as well. But but uh, all that kind of extracurricular, the, the non-professional, the, you know, uh, raising money for charities or, or even, um, yeah, again, just giving people their time who want to talk to him or write him a letter or, or, or call him up on the phone. I mean, he's not, uh, he's very approachable. Um, and he's just a decent, he's a decent human being. And, and, and as simple as that sounds, you know, certainly anyone who lives in the New York metropolitan area would know there's, no, it, it's, it, I don't know, there's something about it where people lose their decency sometimes. I mean, yeah. it's just like, yeah, you know, Warren Buffett. I forgot if it was a commencement speech or literally just this past week. I was reading about him, just saying, "Listen, the majority of life is essentially just some of these basics." Yeah, you know, saying saying please, saying thank you, exactly. following up. <laughs> you know, a lot of these basic things are what he was. You know, it wasn't a commencement speech. He he was talking to like like some senior executives and saying, "Really, this is where it starts." Well, so yeah, and I think I think what I've found in and I've been very fortunate because of documentaries or because of filmmaking, I've, I've been in the room with many people who have been at the, the top echelon of, mm -hmm. of their careers or their respective fields. And what I noticed that so many people have in common at that level is there is an art to living and that there's a way that people conduct themselves and handle themselves that is, um, yeah, that, that a lot of just basic decency, good manners, um, you know, eye contact when they're talking to you. I mean, there's, it's a, like it's not it, yeah it just seems so simple but you realize how it isn't it's n not that easy in yeah. some regards but yeah Bobby Valentine Karen Duffy another person you've had on the show um she's another one who is a a solid like very generous person as yeah. far as her time uh and just what amazes me about somebody like Duff and who's been another mentor and role model for me is that she has a very wide network but it's not superficial because when she sees somebody, she'll call up, oh, whatever happened to your nephew who was applying to college? Or it's, you realize, <laughs> yeah. wow, for, for a woman who's, who's dealt with all that she's dealt with in, in her chronic illness, like her recall for very particular, you realize, wow, when, when you have her time, you, gen, you legitimately have her time. She listens when you speak to her. So we went to lunch. Duff, yeah. Duff and I yeah. we were talking about. And she was remembering the people's names that were, you know, again, took the time. She was so present. Yeah. She was remembering the names of the people that, that waited on us. And I just, and, and I'd introduced her to a couple people while we were there. And again, to your point, she, she was 100% present. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I was, I was really impressed with that. So but let's talk more about you. Let's talk mm -hmm. about your, you know, you're, you're extremely impressive. You know, the meals, the people that you've had the opportunity to sit across from the, yeah. uh, from the table. Are there any that you'd like to talk about and some of the takeaways like you were just sharing before that, that you have, that you've walked away with that are positive? Um, yeah, well, look, I, in talking about the people who have, who have shaped me, I think that is a way of talking about myself. I mean, those are the people yeah. that I've, that I've learned from, um, you know, whether it's a Bobby Valentine or Karen Duffy, uh, uh, also a lot of the films that I've made, I've mentioned are, are about sports and about athletes and the, just the discipline that's required to compete at a world-class level, whether it's sprinters in Jamaica you know, college football players at UCLA, I mean, at, at, across the board. Yeah, there, there is drive and discipline. And it, so it is not only about 
um, you know, how you behave and how you act and how you live your life, but it is also that the other component too is, is drive and focus and kind of what, what you're trying to achieve. And I, I feel like that's something that, um, in everything I do, it, it's tough because in my, in my field of being an independent producer, um, which can mean so many things now in this decentralized world of media. I mean, just in the last year alone, I was, I did a podcast for ESPN. I did a digital video for Vice. I worked on a TV series for MSNBC and I'm producing a, a, a scripted film with this company, Skydance, basically a mini studio. I mean, that's, you know, uh, and are all these projects going on simultaneously? Well, uh, yeah, at the time that was that; those were just the projects I was working on in 2018, mm -hmm. uh, last year. So, so I mean, so you kind of have to wear many hats. Uh, I mean, being a producer, there's no, there's, it's not like the way I, the way I describe it to people, it's not like going to, you know, you want to be a lawyer, you have to go to law school. You want to be a doctor, you have to go to medical school. There's like a prescribed chart of what you have to do, right? And what, what I'm doing uh, is basically a choose your own adventure. Um, and so it does require that, that focus that I've, I've seen other people that in, in their kind of respective fields, you know, uh, yeah, drive, focus, a discipline of you can't rest on your laurels. You can't, mm -hmm. you, um, you know, you can't get comfortable basically. Uh, how do you get, how do you get these jobs? Clearly, you're building a name for yourself. So people are starting to find out about you, but what have you done um, besides that to ascertain some of these opportunities? I think it is a lot about, I mean, the, the field of, um, uh, of independent producing is all about relationships. It, because at the end of the day, if you're working on a project that usually is gonna span many months, if not years, you wanna work with people that you know, that you trust and that you know, you're going to spend a lot of time with them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you, oftentimes people I hire or people I work with or people that I've worked with on other projects. We had we, uh, case in point, even just going again, going back to Bobby, we made that first film. He was the subject of the first documentary I produced. And I was like, Hey, we had a good time. Why don't we produce more films together? So, so as far as getting jobs, yeah. So it's, uh, it, it is just kind of cultivating that, that base, but then when it comes when when it comes down to venturing into something that I'm, um, you know, where I don't have the Rolodex, it is you know asking somebody, hey, do you know somebody who knows somebody, or can you put me in touch with? Um, it is a lot of kind of connecting the dots. Uh, yeah. So something that you were telling me at lunch that I thought was brilliant. Uh, if you don't mind, regurgitate. If you don't mind, yeah, <laughs> we're regurgitating yeah. that story about what you did to bring a team together on a challenging project. You, sure. know, you know what I'm talking about? Sure. Yeah. 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 So I, I won't get into specifics because the, the project sure. still hasn't come out yet. Okay. But but basically, I was. Let, let me say. Let me then interject yeah, for one okay. second. High profile organization. Is that a fair? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Disgruntled. No, it was just, it was, it was tense. It was, I was coming onto a project where, um, you know, there was just kind of, uh, people weren't seeing eye to eye or getting along and, and it involved a lot of travel and you had a nine person crew and that was nine a lot or is that a little, uh, nine is, is a, there's a fair amount. I mean, we're doing this thing now. There's one camera. Yeah. There's a crew of zero. I mean, that, <laughs> so, and you can shoot things with, with one person, two person, but for, for a documentary, Nine people, you know, okay. two cameras, assistant camera. I mean, you're, you're, that's, that's a pretty healthy a crew. size okay. crew. And so some of the dysfunction that was going on, uh, was trickling down to, to the crew because it was, you know, there's, there's hosts and producers and, and yeah, that affects the people who are just, you know, have to shoot the thing and record the sound. And, and when I came onto this project and part of my, my job was to kind of write this, this ship, um, I, I found that after we'd, we'd break for the day, we'd stop shooting, everybody would go their separate ways um, and go back to their hotels and often order room service, which is crummy food and overpriced. So it's costing the production money and um, it's really not doing anything constructive because we're only interacting when we're in this kind of high pressure environment. So what I started doing was um, putting, you know, looking whenever, whatever city we'd be in, looking up restaurants that were well-reviewed, well-regarded, 
uh, that would still fit in the budget. And considering that we were spending money on room service, it was, it was certainly cheaper than ordering room service. And I just put it out to the crew of totally optional. You can do what you want, but you know, I'm going here. If you want to join me, feel free. And, and yeah, it became kind of a hallmark of these shoots where every night, even especially if it was a long day, uh, I mean, because there were some shoot days where, you know, we're working 12, 13, 14 hours. Uh, it was kind of nice knowing that having the crew look forward to, all right, there's going to be a good meal, good food, someplace new, and maybe a city we haven't been to before or haven't had the chance to explore. Um, but food is a really, what I found from very early on is a, um, I, I don't want to say cheap, but but it is an inexpensive way to boost morale, mm-hmm. um, you know, where you don't have to. and And... I think the proof of all this was one of our DPs of, of, of the shoot, the director of photography, is uh, well regarded, has worked on many projects uh, for a bunch of different TV channels, been on, you know, has shot numerous films. Uh, he said, this is by far my lowest paying job at the moment, but this is my most enjoyable. Um, Kudos. Yeah, and that, that meant a lot, being that, again, when I came onto the project, there was just it was just not a fun environment to be in and you fast forward to us wrapping it up four or five months later and the crew's like yeah if, if i get a call that this that we're shooting like i'm all for it right. um so it is uh you know i i'd say filmmaking tv uh any any sort of of you know what's under that umbrella of content these days it's all collaborative medium mm-hmm. and you can see you'll see films that say a film by so and so um, but it still is a collaborative that that director uh, whether it's Spike Lee or Steven Spielberg they depend on a, a massive crew of people to execute that singular vision but oftentimes films are you know a creative by committee you have an editor you have somebody writing the music you have somebody uh, even color grading, fixing the color on on the shots after the thing's edited. Mm. You have so many individual uh, people at play that it is uh, it is a team sport. Filmmaking is very much uh, dependent on everybody, kind of not only doing what they do and doing it well, but rowing in the same direction as everybody else. That's really interesting. And so, if you it looks call a you know say it's a hundred percent of a scene. How much would you say is what, how much you control? You know, how much of that hundred percent do you make up versus those nine other people? Well, the, so the role of the producer, I think, is just to anticipate that everything is going to go wrong. Okay. So, um, in the sense that with documentaries, even if you have interviews scheduled and you have to be at location X at this time, location Y at this time, uh, you know, I've had, I've, I've, I've been on shoots where the PA forgot where he parked the car. Uh, I mean, you can think, uh, or uh, we got the wrong address for some reason. You, any, anything can, yeah. can go wrong. Uh, you, you're stuck in traffic and it delays you from getting to that second location. Um, you name it. I mean, you, so so I feel like being a producer or, or a director on a shoot like that is, is anticipating, the, you know, not what's coming up, but what could happen and, and just keeping your cool and problem solving. And that's why I think what I've, I'm excited to move into uh, narrative films, which are much bigger in scope mm-hmm. than what I've been doing up to this point. Uh, but documentaries, if, if nothing else, have been a fun uh, mental challenge because it is, it's all about problem solving. So mm-hmm. it's, and it's setting up the crew to succeed so that, um, so to your point, how much of it is, is, is it, is it my responsibility? It's, it's, so we get to a location late and we're shooting an interview with somebody who say only has 30 minutes or 20. Now it's because we're late. They only have 15 minutes. It's not freaking out the crew and, you know, making sure that we're, we're working expeditiously, but not stressing everybody out. So somebody makes a careless mistake or, or, um, you know, forgets to make sure the camera's running or something, you know, anything. So, so you don't, so it is. It's it's setting setting up the crew. I think feel like my job is to anticipate problems and and setting up the rest of the crew for success, so that whatever situation we find ourselves in, uh, we're in a situation to succeed. So is it hard to have? So you're juggling a lot of things. So your job is obviously like the day job of doing the work. Mm-hmm. You also have to find the work. Right. Then you got to staff for the work. 
right? Is that, yeah. Would you say those are the three primary functions? I'm sure there's other ones sure. too, but those are, yeah. They, yeah. I, I, it, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, especially running a company because what Bobby and I have is a small production company. It's, it's, it's a pretty lean staff uh, of me being the main day-to-day -day person mm -hmm. and anybody that we hire out, um, uh, you know, I'm responsible for finding the crew and, and, and for projects that we originate, I'm responsible for developing those projects. I've, I've certainly, so to that point, I've worked for other media companies where I basically, they brought me on to produce something for them that, that's already in the works. It's, uh, it's a different experience and it's a fun, I mean, that's feels more like a nine to five of, Hey, I'm going to do my best. Um, and I'm going to give you, you know, all my attention and, and, uh, focus on this. But at the end of the day, uh, there isn't that ownership, that mm -hmm. same ownership to a project that, you know, you've basically lost many nights of sleep over, uh, which is the case when you're developing projects, when you're raising money, when you're the one responsible for if something screws up, you have to make the phone call and apologize for blowing somebody's, uh, you know, hard earned money that they, they invested in your project. When the people that you're raising money, a lot of these, the capital that you're raising, how much of it is, yes, we want a definite return versus this is a passion play for us versus they really, maybe they're just more behind exactly what that content itself is. Or also some of them just like to have fun and see what, you know, cause they know odds are it's kind of, it's almost like restaurants. You yeah. Know, that, I'd that, say it's a mix of all that. Yeah. I mean, I, I've really, when Bobby and I started our company, there was kind of a first round where, where we raised a bunch of money and, and, and it was guys who knew Bobby, uh, like I said, who were familiar with the first film I had made. And it was really just a, it was something different. Uh, you know, they were definitely were looking for a return and there's, and I've, I've kind of written checks back. Uh, so it's, it, you know, the, the business model moving forward, um, that I found is getting license fees up front from TV networks, kind of pre-selling the film. So, you, so with every film, I don't have to go out and necessarily ask another individual, Hey, can you write me a check? But, go to a TV network and say, Hey, um, can you basically advance the money for the TV rights for this project? So that's a little bit, e it makes things a little bit easier in the sense that I'm not constantly, you know, I'm not diluting shares or I'm not, um, also again, asking people to, to fork over their hard earned money for a very speculative project. Um, so that's been good, but no, I, I'd say anybody who, who gets into films should, if they, if they don't, uh, have the mindset of, uh, it's a very risky investment and you should be, you know, it should be an investment in the sense that there should be an idea that you're going to get your money back, but that should not be the primary focus as far as, you know, I think most people, it's something different. It's, it's an opportunity for them to, you know, learn something new, meet new people. Um, yeah. It's, and, and, and I think, I think most of the partners that we have in our company have, have, have found, uh, have, have found it rewarding in some some way, shape, or form. Yeah. Yeah. And then because you've been doing documentaries where you're going on location, do you have any choice of where you're filming? Or like, I know Atlanta, you get a lot of tax credits. So I don't know if mm -hmm. you do stuff there or if that, does that benefit you or that will just be in the next phase of your filming career? Yeah, with documentaries, you kind of go where the story is. Yeah. Um, so it's not like you have 30 shoot days in Georgia like you would on a scripted movie or or where it's like, you know, Atlanta or New Orleans can both stand in for New York, and which is the better tax incentive. With documentaries, it, it is just you know wherever the story takes you. Uh, New York has some has has tax incentives um, for post production things like that, and so there's been projects I've worked on that have taken advantage of of those. But but no, you're not really. Um, you know, you don't really have the, the luxury of, of chasing down like tax incentives the way scripted movies do. But um, yeah, it's yeah, what's been interesting, I think, with documentaries versus scripted movies is it is it's the fundamentals are more or less the same. It's, and it has even though most people and I know this just by talking to people and say Hollywood, they'll say, oh, yeah, I want to get into narrative films by way of documentaries. And they'll say, no, that's not how you do it. I mean, the, the, the funny thing is there is no right or wrong way to get into films. Everybody has a different story. But I've 
certainly found, and I'm very comfortable in my own journey, and I feel like it has informed me as a narrative filmmaker in the sense that not only have I met people I otherwise wouldn't have met, I've been to places I otherwise wouldn't have seen. It has definitely informed me as a human being a lot more than if I've just been toiling away trying to write screenplays for the last 10 years. Um, but on, on, on top of that, um, it's just been, you know, the fundamentals of, of business and producing are more or less the same as far as raising money, uh, sticking to, to a budget, sticking to a schedule, finding distribution. I mean, those, you know, where you get into bigger projects, obviously you're talking about bigger money, but you're also then talking about costuming and casting and these other, there's other yeah. team members of the team and those crews, you know, a nine person <laughs> crew is considered a small <laughs> crew, but, but documentaries has been a fun um, uh, you know, sandbox, if you will, uh, an opportunity to tell stories, to um, you know, and just and just learn the kind of craft of of filmmaking by by way of real stories. So now, as your career is expanding, you're getting more projects, bigger projects, bigger name for yourself. It sounds to me, unless I'm just hearing this wrong, that it's becoming more. You're handling a lot more of the business side, not that you didn't before but you're seeing more aspects of the business side. Is that A, accurate? B, is it something that you're enjoying? Yeah, no, it is accurate. And I guess I've always been more of a producer first and a director second. Mm -hmm. And for people who don't know the difference between the two, and the producer, as a professor at film school once said, you know, the, the Oscar for best producer is called best picture. So, and it's true. They're, yeah, they're the yeah. ones who accept the Oscar for best picture, the producers of the film. The producer really is responsible for the you know the from the inception of the of the project to the distribution all phases whereas the director is really responsible for the creative side um, and so when I've worked on projects I've I've always been I've never just directed a I've, there's been projects where I've been the producer and then I also directed it but I've always been at least the producer as far as it's something that I've originated or something that I was on very a project I was on very early at and then kind of developed and kind of saw through to the end. And that's fun only because it does allow you to work on many projects at once. I mean, being a director, you know, you really have to, because you're responsible for the creative vision, um, it's tough to get sidetracked by the business and, and obviously money is a part of it, but you, but you really want to, you know, uh, focus solely on the creative vision. That's tough to do when mm -hmm. you're, saddled with fundraising and things like that. But on the flip side, when I am just dealing with the producing aspect, yeah, I can have my my uh, toe in many, dipped in many ponds at the same time, which, which yeah, is pretty pretty rewarding. Now, is the most, how do I word this? Um, what is, I should say, is there a single most challenging thing in what you do, or is it most you know there's a certain during the the life of a project this is what's most challenging at a certain time that makes sense or do you mean to re no word no it, it does um and i i mean i can talk about this project i have now uh called the greatest beer run ever which is a project that is currently set up at skydance which is a mini studio uh it's going to be written and directed by peter farrelly who for just won the Oscar know. for Green Book? Okay, yeah. and was you know one half of the Farrelly brothers team, Dumb and Dumber, something about Mary. So, um, but that project is something that that goes back to twenty fourteen. Yeah, so the spring of twenty fourteen, a friend of mine, Joanna Malloy, told me about this story that she had heard about a guy who was a merchant marine from Manhattan that snuck into Vietnam in nineteen sixty eight to bring his buddies beer and then got stuck there during the Tet Offensive. And so for whatever reason, it was an urban legend. It was told at McFadden's Bar, where everybody from the Daily News used to hang out at on 42nd and 2nd. And nobody ever wrote about it. It was everybody's favorite urban legend that nobody ever wrote about. And Joanna Molloy, after she left the Daily News, wanted to write a book about it. So she tells me the story. I, my immediate reaction was, that sounds like a movie. And amazingly, she said, well, you know, I found these guys, which was no easy task, because the guy who brought the beer is named John Chicky Donahue. Uh, the other guys are Rick Dugan, Tom Collins. I mean, oh god, how do you yeah. find those? Guys? Exactly. <laughs> and amazingly, Joanna, the good journalist she is, found these guys. They all corroborated the story. They were they had, local? Were they? Uh, no. Well, let's. I think. I think one of them was in Pennsylvania. Another was in Yonkers. Another was in Florida. I mean, they were. Yeah, they were. And so They're spread out. Yeah. No, it took. It definitely took some some detective work on her part. 
And they had some of the guys had photographs of this guy Chicky in Vietnam with the beer, and she found Chicky who had his passport from Saigon. So she said, you know, I, I found these guys, they corroborated the story, but they haven't seen each other in 40 years. They basically, after the war and they got back to Inwood, they all kind of went their separate ways. As, as you know, in any ethnic neighborhood, it happens. People move out mm -hmm. and start their own families. So I had the idea of, well, while you write the book, why don't we reunite these guys and make a uh, documentary about it and use that as a proof of concept for a narrative film. And Good idea. So three and one. Yeah. And amazingly, we got Pap's Blue Ribbon, which was the beer he brought to Vietnam to sponsor the short documentary. Uh, we shot it a year later, then this is how long it took as far as just so this getting... Is two, so today it's 2019. This started in 2014. 14. Yeah, so she tells me the story in spring of 2014. Mm -hmm. We don't shoot the documentary, the reunion, until June of 2015 because the, the effort of getting the money and negotiating the contracts with Pabst and the whole thing. And, and then, uh, yeah, we wanted to shoot it in New York. So we had to also find a time when all these guys were available to be in New York. And so we got them at a bar uh, up uh, in the Bronx, across from Inwood. And it was the first time. Amazingly, they, they were really good about it, too, because they knew that Joanna had tracked down the other guys, and they were very good about not asking for each other's contact info. Because You're kidding me. When, they, uh. when you see the video, it's on YouTube. Just search the greatest beer run ever. That's a genuine re reaction, as those guys see each other for the first time uh, in, in, in 40 years. And they tell the story of what happened. So the film came out on uh, Veterans Day of 2015. And it just went up on Pap's YouTube channel. And there, I was very lucky because they're a company that, I don't know if it's still true today, but back then they didn't use an ad agency. They did everything in house. So in that regard, they were very approachable, but everything's very organic with them. And so this was something they, they put up on Veterans Day and they just put it out there. It's not like they were putting out TV yeah, commercials were, or anything. No drip campaign. And no, but, um, but with my friend Karen Duffy's help, her and I, basically hit up every Veterans Affairs Facebook group, every American Legion post on Facebook, every um, like mail blog. Eventually we got Bro Bible to like post about it. And the thing snowballed, it went viral. It was number one on Reddit at one point. Sure. Um, and has, it has over half a million YouTube uh, views, which is pretty good considering it's a 12 minute documentary. And that led us, you know, to today where now the, the project is set up at Skydance and with Peter Farrelly attached to it. But that's, so there's a lot of ups and downs as far as getting the short made and then getting the film rights to the book that Joanna wrote and getting her and Chicky to trust me, somebody who's never made a film. And this is obviously a period movie, a uh, big budget. So, you know, overcoming the question of, well, how do you know how to produce a movie like this? You've never made it. You know, you, all you know is documentaries. So, um, you know. What did you have to do? How did you do that? I, I guess I wore them down and, and made a good sales pitch as far as the fact that I, I think I had demonstrated to them up to that point that I had hustled my butt off to get that that short documentary made. And, and as you can imagine, there's not a lot of money in short YouTube videos. <laughs> so uh, it was about my belief in the story and just my passion for getting that story told. And it was just basically, look, you know, you don't have to give me the rights indefinitely, but at least I, I think I deserve a first shot at trying to make this thing happen, being that that was the intent going into it all along is that this deserves to be a Hollywood movie. And uh, amazingly, the, the folks at Skydance saw the video, ultimately Peter Farrelly saw the video, um, and you know, knock on wood, it's, it's coming together. Uh, but that's a project where, again, what, yeah, so five years since I first learned about the story and we're still on this path to try and get it made as a, as a Hollywood movie. So um, when you ask what's the hardest part about the job, I think, a lot of it is patience. Mm. Uh, it's knowing that things aren't going to happen on your schedule, <laughs> that yeah. things aren't necessarily always going to happen on a schedule, that you have to 
so yeah, so it's, it's me taking on a lot of projects knowing that not everything's gonna hit at once. And if they do hit at once, that's a good problem to have. So, and that goes back to what I was talking about, about focus and, and uh, discipline, because the other thing I had to learn uh, is, okay, I take on a bunch of projects, but I, I wanna make sure I'm not constantly in sell mode. I also have to deliver what I'm, I'm talking about. I can't have just a bunch of ideas on a page. That doesn't, won't do me any good. So once I have ideas for projects, actually seeing through to making them happen. And I think that's the, you know, I've seen there, that's the deficit that I think a lot of people that in, in Hollywood or where else have is, is uh, there's a lot of idea people out there, but there's not a lot of people who would just go out and execute. do it. Yeah. yeah. And I think having that, you know, being able to execute, but also with the nuance of knowing that time is never going to, is not always going to work the way you think it will. And, and just being patient with that, okay, well, I can't force this here, but maybe I can work on, I can occupy my time and my, my attention on this while I wait for this other thing to break. Uh, and what do you do to manage all these projects? I mean, you must be extremely, do you use a project management software or like, how do you keep all of these moving parts? No, I get well, I'm 33. 30 small, so yeah. it's, fortunately I've been able to just go off of memory and, uh, <sighs> oh, and, not gonna and, last notes, long, <laughs> and notes in my iPhone. Uh -huh. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's, the, that's what it's been up to this point is, uh, and for a while, actually I moved and so I lost it, but for a while I actually had a marker board in my apartment where I would jot down, um, you know, every project that mm -hmm. I had in the hopper from something that was just an idea to something that I was actually shooting. And next to every project I would have what needs, what's the next step, what needs to get done. Uh, it's something I still do, not just not on the marker board, but on my phone. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of every day, I'll kind of just keep track of what am I working on? What, what could I be doing? Uh, what should I be doing? Uh, I think it's always good. One thing I've found is to have in a job that is not a traditional nine to five where I sit down at my desk and I have work waiting for me is to end every day knowing how I'm going to start the next day. And sitting down and knowing like, okay, even if it's just firing off emails, I need to get back to this person or I need to call this person or I need to send something, I need to go to the FedEx, something to just, just get the day going and saying, all right, I know, you know, there's X, Y, and Z. And that, that actually came from advice that a, a professor at NYU told us in a screenwriting class where it's, he said, you know, you should stick to... If you're writing screenplay, see if you can write 10 pages a day. And even if you get to a point where you can write more, that's a good place to stop because then you know you have a place to start from mm. the next day. And I think it is sometimes, as I'm sure many people know, the, the hardest time to get something going is when you're not working. Like, you know, the old, like, I think Lucille Ball is credited with the expression, if you want something done, ask a busy person, right? Yep. And that's the busiest so, person you know. Yeah. And, and so, you know, that impetus to get going, how am I starting to, I think that's, that's really important. Mm. So what did NYU do a good job of the, teaching you the technicals in terms of on the execution side? Did they do a good job of, I guess, how to run a project or? Yeah. I mean, NYU, especially the film program, it's a BFA. So Bachelor of Fine Arts, not a BA means that it's more production oriented. So mm -hmm. there is a lot of um, learning by doing student films, student projects. So that, that's great because you, um, yeah, you just have the opportunity to see what works, what doesn't work. But so, so you've had to learn a lot on the job, right? I mean, this is oh, like, you yeah. said, you I mean, but going... filmmaking, filmmaking is all, is all on the job training. And that's why when people, um, funny enough, it was advice that was given to me from Brett Ratner, who is a film director, producer. I, I spoke to him. I interviewed him for a project when I was a freshman. He went to NYU in the late 80s. And I was asking about internships or working on a film set. And he said, no, you should be making films. If you're a filmmaker, you should just pick up a camera and shoot a film. Because he goes, you're not going to learn anything by getting somebody coffee. Uh, not if you want to be a film. If you want to be a director, you should be out directing. And that was great advice. I mean, that's what me and my buddies ended up doing. We made a film for ESPN, uh, which was the kind of best case scenario in that regard. But I, I, but there's something to that, and especially in this day and age when cameras are easily available, anybody can edit a film on their computer. 
Uh, so yeah, if you're a filmmaker, there's no reason why you shouldn't be making films. But to answer your question, and it and it goes back to that Brett Redner point, is what it, I think NYU set me up for, and I think what its biggest strength is the network. Is I would always equate it to the same way, you know, part of the appeal of Ivy League schools is you tap into this large alumni base. NYU in the film department is similar in the regard that, you know, NYU film, there is a camaraderie. Uh, if I see it on somebody's resume, they went to NYU, I'm, I'm, you know, even just like subconsciously going to give them the benefit of the doubt. Well, so, so to that point, there's, there's always a willingness, uh, like with Brett Ratner, I hit him up, Hey, I'm an NYU film student. Uh, I'd love to talk about X, Y, or Z. Yeah. He got back to me. And there are other, other instances where you, you'd reach out to other NYU alum and just say, Hey, I'm, I'm an, I'm a film student and I need advice and they'd get back to you. So that was great. But then also just the network of, uh, people that you end up working with professionally, uh, that, you know, these are, these are your peers in, in the industry. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's kind of what NYU, what differentiates itself from a lot of the other programs is, uh, and I think there's a general ethos of, of just hustle and the, the way that gets the film made is the way to make the film that <laughs> there's not of it, it's, it's, yeah, it's a lot of like grill filmmaking ta techniques and just, yeah, like any way you can get your money or shoot the film, like that's the way to do it, which is, which is great. Uh, and I think it's a little different mentality than, than kind of maybe what's on the West Coast. But, but ultimately it is, it is the network and the people that come to speak at classes, the people you're in class with. Because at the end of the day, you can watch a movie, you can read books. Uh, there's, you know, you don't need to go to an NYU film class to learn how to write a screenplay. Mm. So, so you talk about the network. Are there pe are these people that you've, besides just being part of the NYU network, are there other people that you've worked with along the years that you just have been impressed with? And you, you know, there are things that you do to stay in touch with them, even if it's just a hello or an email or a text. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um... Well, like I said, I mean, Karen Duffy has been a huge, uh, has been a huge friend and mentor. Uh, there's, a, yeah, I mean, there's, a, I've cultivated a lot of people that I've stayed in touch with yeah. along the way. I mean, she's, she was more of a social friend who's professionally been, been, a, a, been a great, just confidant and resource. Bobby Valentine I talked about as another one, but, but there's other people that, um, you know, maybe I met because I was doing a, a short documentary or was trying to develop a TV show that never went anywhere that we've just stayed in touch and because they're interesting people or, um, yeah, that, I mean, yeah, that I'll, I'll do you see LinkedIn? them time time. I, I do, but I, I, I can't say I seriously use LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's, it's, I'm on there because, you know, why not? But it's not something that I regularly, um, yeah, that, that I'm like an, I'm not an active LinkedIn user. Yeah, gotcha. um, so what, what about people that are reaching out to you? Like what kinds of people now you're getting quite a name for yourself? Mm -hmm. Are you getting hit up from people? And, and if so, how quickly do you respond? What are people that grab your attention? Do you care to elaborate yeah. on it? Yeah. No, I, I, um, uh, yeah, I, people have just randomly cold called me and, and look, I, being that I've been the one cold calling and, and still will randomly yeah. cold call people. I, it's, I do believe that, you know, you got to treat others the way you want to be treated. So I'm not going to be a jerk. If somebody, if somebody randomly reaches out to me and says, uh, Hey, I, I'd love to pick your brain or, Hey, I have this idea for a project. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly going to give them, uh, my time and, and, Again, because I I'm not that far removed from being in that position, and many times I still feel like I am in that position. So, uh, look, I, I think th what documentaries have taught me is that everybody has a story to tell, and you never know where that story is going to come from. Yeah. And so, right. So, if somebody sees something that I that I've produced and um, said, "Hey, I saw this. I'm, I'm, you know, maybe you should know about X, Y, or Z." Yeah. Because we're going to put your contact info yeah. in, in the notes for people that are interested in reaching out to you. Are there any people in particular that you'd love to hear from, whether it's an aspiring director, whether it's someone who's ready to write a check and wants to be behind one of your movies, or maybe it's somebody that's just in the business in general? Yeah, I think it's all of the above. I mean, as I said before, 
filmmaking is a collaborative medium. So it, I, I'm certainly, I, I'm not somebody who works on an island who, you know, um, I, if, if anything, the more, the more people I can get into the process and work with, the, the more enjoyable I find the experience to be. So yeah, I, I've, um, yeah, I love meeting new people. I like expanding my base. Uh, and like I said, I've, I've also be, whether it's seeing people like Bobby Valentine, the way he interacts with people who reach out to him and just being very generous with his time, we're also just knowing, uh, that everybody has a story and that, that you never know. I should never kind of dismiss something, you know, because I don't know the person where it's coming from, uh, I, you know, we live in, we live in a world where everybody is connected that it, it's, it's almost, it would be kind of counterproductive to, to try and shut yourself off from, from people that can connect with you over the internet. I mean, that's so many of my projects. Um, another one, uh, I, I produced a documentary called Schooled, which was based on an article written by Taylor Branch, uh, an article about the NCAA. And Taylor Branch is a Pulitzer Prize winning civil rights scholar. He wrote an article in The Atlantic in October of 2011 that had this, uh, was kind of seen as this watershed moment in, in the fight for NCAA athlete rights, because it was the first time that somebody who was not affiliated with sports, he's a civil rights scholar, kind of looked at the issue of the treatment of NCAA athletes and opined that, yes, yeah, something is off here and something needs to be done. And I had just reached out to him through Twitter. I'd read his article and sent him a tweet saying, hey, would you be interested in turning this into a documentary? So, like I said, I'm, I've been the beneficiary mm -hmm. of, of just reaching out to people through the internet who I find to be inspiring or interesting. So, uh, if, uh, if somebody feels that way about me or wants to connect with me, but yeah, if, I think that's great. Awesome. Before I let you go, I want to do a couple of random questions. Yeah. That's where you choose. Okay. <laughs> Give me a, a number between uh, one and 15. 13. 13. What would you define as uh, one of your most defining moments? Huh. Did I say 13? I meant, I meant eight. <laughs> um, you got a lot of them already. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd say... So we were talking about this uh, before we started the podcast, but there, there's a documentary that I that I recently produced and directed about Anthony Scaramucci called Mooch, which I totally recommend people check out. Yeah. Um, it was oh, it something awesome. that I had started. You know, he's somebody again. I met through Bobby Valentine in 2008. He immediately struck me as a character, and I was interested in making a film about him pretty much from then on. And in 2014, he, he reached out to me again. We'd stayed in touch. And he said, hey, you still want to make a documentary about me? I said, yeah, sure. And so it was kind of a very low-cost proposition. He's in New York. I'm in New York. I have a camera. So every so often, a few times a year, I'd meet up with him, uh, film him. He had a conference in Las Vegas. He still does the SALT conference. I'd go out there, film, you know, shadow him, film him there. But I was basically amassing footage. I had no idea what was, I mean, I'd be lying if I said there was some grand plan. It really wasn't. It was just, I knew I had a character. And the way I see it is all documentaries have three components. You need a good character, you need a good story, and there needs to be, it needs to be relevant. There needs to be a reason why people want to watch it. So with Scaramucci, circa 2014, I knew I had a character. I didn't know what the story was, and I didn't know if anybody would care to watch it. So it's not until Trump wins in 2016 that I realize oh, he might get a job in the administration. I'm sitting on all this footage. So I started editing the footage I had. Uh, and the summer... And you edit yourself? You no, do I, I, I brought okay. on uh, uh, editor John Connors, his name. We'd worked with, we'd worked together on some other projects. And basically I called him up and I said, you know, I'm sitting on this pile of footage of this guy who may or may not work for tr in the Trump administration. You know, can I toss you some money to just watch the footage? Because that's the other thing. I was just putting this stuff on a hard drive for all these years. I never watched any of it. So I said, I don't even know what I have. Would you mind watching it? And let, letting, just objectively letting me know your assessment. Like, is there any, can, is there a film to be made? So let, let me ask you this. Sorry to interrupt. Mm -hmm. So I would think that there, and I'm sure a lot of this you forgot about, 
right? Mm-hmm. Like this is stuff you've, you've documented it. You generally remember. Uh, yeah, you the don't footage. Remember. Yeah, I, I remembered what I'd shot, but the particulars, no. And so yeah. you don't know if he's if you're sitting on a gem in there, something that might have been said that could be relevant to today. And, yeah. And then the reason I'm going there is that you have to implicitly trust John, mm-hmm. right? So so how, how does that happen? How did that? I want to get well, back to that. Yeah, but that's an important... I mean, I mean, so so he watched it and said, "Yeah, I, the guy's a character. I don't know exactly what the story is, but like, sure, we could make a film out of this." And at that point is when I figured, well, if if I made this guy sit through and screen all this stuff, I better do as well. So I I, I screened the footage because I didn't. Have, I, I maybe had eighty hours or you know eighty five hours, ninety hours. So it was manageable. It, it took a while to look through all of it, but, um, and there was some good, I mean, and I give Anthony credit. There were some prescient things that he was saying before the 2016 election, um, that, that definitely resonated post Trump winning in, in 2016, as far as disenfranchised blue collar voters and, um, you know, stuff with China. So there's, there's some pretty good material in there. Um, but again, the question is what's the defining moment? So, you know, we're working on this thing. It's July, uh, 2017. Anthony gets hired as the communications director for the white house. He gets fired basically a week and a half later. Now there's a lot of interest in this project that, that I'm working on. Uh, it comes out in page six in the New York Post that Andrew Moscato is sitting on all this footage of Anthony Scaramucci. So, you know, str- starting to get a lot of calls from, um, from different buyers that are interested in the film. So for a bunch of different reasons, the, uh, the sale that we thought we could have made didn't happen. And, what I am, the, the defining moment, I, what I think I'm very proud about is not losing my cool as far as not letting it, I mean, it certainly bothered me um, because we were talking about basically a film that was made for relatively nothing be sold for, you know, quite a bit of money. Um, but it wasn't, um, you know, there was definitely disappointment, but, but there wasn't any, I, I would say there wasn't any bitterness. Um, I didn't, fire my agents immediately. A lot of people say, what are you doing sticking around with those guys? I mean, look, they, they tried. I mean, uh, that, you know, there was people that were interested in buying it that kind of backed out. I wasn't upset with them. I mean, so I think the, my feeling is I'm 33. I'm, I'm still playing the long game in the sense that, I say that all the time. yeah. And so, uh, it's knowing that, yeah, you could maybe, maybe it would feel good to, to scream at people and to lose your cool and to flip out. But it, in the long term, that's not going to do you any favors. Um, it's certainly not going to uh, engender any, any good, good <laughs> feelings towards other people in the industry. And so you kind of just have to, you got to just accept your losses. And, and it was, you know, like I said, it was, it was a very interesting experience. And, and the film is out there for people to watch. And I'm very proud of the film that we made. So it wasn't it wasn't a it wasn't a loss uh, like in it wasn't a loss in the sense that um, you know we didn't make the film. It was I'm very proud of it, but it didn't turn out the way you expected it. Mm-hmm. And and yeah, expectations I think can be your own your own worst enemy. Um, in you think something's going to turn out some way and it doesn't, and you have to see the the potential success hiding in that immediate Silver disappointment line, yeah. without a doubt. Uh, and that goes back to what's the job of a producer. A job of a producer is anticipating things not working out the way you plan. So yeah, I think you kind of have, I certainly constantly remind myself of that, that things rarely work out the way they, they do. But the other thing is if they can work out, if they work out the way you, you, you don't expect for the worse, the pendulum can swing the other way and they can work out the way you don't expect for the better. And that's happened. I'm very grateful that that's happened to me enough times to believe that, that, okay, this is a setback or yeah, this didn't work out the way I expect, but just keep moving forward. Um, don't, you know, don't lose who you are, you know, um, maintain your character, maintain the moral high ground and just keep moving forward. And eventually it, it'll come back to you in ways you don't, you don't anticipate. And it is funny because then you can kind of play the game of, well, if I didn't do this or if this didn't happen, this wouldn't happen. And uh, I'm the de- direct result. My career is the result of a lot of those moments. And um, 
And I think a lot of that too, kind of to branch off. So the defining moments, I'm very, I'm very proud of how I kind of kept my cool in a situation that professionally was, was disappointing. But, um, I think on the same kind of branch of that tree is, is just, you got to show up so much, so much in life is just making that effort. Even if you are annoyed or upset, it's like, yeah, go out. If somebody wants to meet up for lunch and talk to it, yeah, show up. You never, you never know what's waiting around the corner. You get invited to something. Yeah. Show up. Do you know the Woody Allen quote? Uh, no, but maybe 80% of life is just showing up. Without a doubt, <laughs> no, yeah, no, it's so without true. a doubt, and 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 and, and, and again, that's one of those things too, where it seems so simple, but it isn't easy. Sometimes you just muster that that energy of oh, I don't feel like it, or oh, I got other stuff to do, and and um, there's been many moments where I said, "What? This is a lot better than had I just stayed at home, or I wouldn't have met this person had I, you know, just mm. sat in front of Netflix and <laughs> yeah." Well, we, they could, you could have watched a good Moscato movie, though. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, last last question before I let you go. Fortunately, there's not enough Moscato movies <laughs> yet where you can still do both. They're right. mutually exclusive. <laughs> um, one to fifteen or fourteen, rather. Um, eight. Going back to eight. Um, do you have any nervous habits? I'll have to watch the tape to see if uh, any came through. <laughs> All right. Well, that's good. Fair yeah. enough. <laughs> Listen, man, one year from now, what will we see that you've accomplished? Well, uh, one year from, so it's July, 2019. Hopefully a year from now we'll have, we'll be getting ready for this beer run movie to, to come out. Uh, I can't, I can't say what the definite time frame is mm-hmm. for that, but, but the hope is that, We'll be on our way to to getting that in the theater near you. So that will be in the theater near you, and by that time, you'll probably have X amount of projects kind of lurking in the back. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, as of right now, off the top of my head, I can think of probably eight or nine different projects that I'm like Jeez. working on some yeah. level. Like some of them are just you know on my to do list. It says like write the pitch for X. Gotcha. So they're they're just ideas, but there are you know but you have at to keep them percolating. Five right? or six that are actively stuff I'm developing that are more than just an idea in my head. Yeah. How do you sleep at night? Pretty well. You do. Yeah. Awesome. Because yeah. <laughs> uh, you're so tired from all these things, or you're just good. No, you're able no. To shut honestly, it I, yeah. and as as cliched as it is, there have been moments where. Um, I, I have to remind myself that this is work and that there are some days where I'll beat myself up because I feel like I didn't, I didn't work or I didn't do anything. And I realized, no, I actually did a lot. It just, I enjoyed what I did. So it didn't feel like it. And again, that, that is, as you say, life by design, right? Uh, I, I feel like i I can totally identify with that. And I'm very fortunate, uh, because I, I realize I've been able to experience, um, certain things that most people just don't have the, the luxury of, of experiencing in their lives. So um, if all this went away tomorrow, you know, I, I'd say I had a good, I had a pretty good run. So it's been a lot of fun. Love that disposition. Love the fact you carved out some time and I'm just loving watching your career go, man. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Keep kicking ass and taking names. Thank you.